Good afternoon. In this video, we're going to look at the opening of the western part of the state of Texas. And this comes about following the Civil War. So we're going to look at the time period from about 1865 to about 1900 and look at the various things that went on in the West. Maybe you're a fan of westerns, cowboys, Indians, railroads, buffalo, farmers, settlers, all of that happens in Texas as well. And what we're going to do is look at from the South Texas cattle drives that took cattle from places like the King Ranch all the way across Texas up into Kansas to catch the train at the railheads and have the cattle shipped back east. So we'll start there and we'll look at the various frontiers in Texas. If we look at the opening of Texas following the Civil War in 1865, we're going to look at ranching. Uh, that's a big part of what's happening in Texas. And of course the cows, the cattle, the horses, and even the sheep, goats, pigs, a lot of that came from Spain. Brought over with the conquistadors came over and the explorers came over in the 1400s, 1500s. And so by the time of the 1800s, the middle of the 19th century, you've had animals from Spain, from Europe, here in the United States for hundreds of years. Some of those were raised by missions, some of those were raised on the ranches that the Spanish had initiated when they were settling Texas. But by now, by the middle of the Civil War, we've gone to open range ranching. In other words, the cattle, uh, the pigs, the goats, the horses are all running free. And you rounded them up and you got them when necessary. As I said, there were sheep and goats were also very important from very early on. And the whole ranching industry is multicultural. You think of the word vaquero, uh, lariat. All of those are words brought in from the Spanish to the English and have been adopted into ranching culture. So it was also true that a lot of the so-called cowboys, uh, they didn't look like John Wayne. They weren't all white. A lot of the cowboys, about a third of them were Hispanic, and about another third were African American. So it was a multicultural frontier. We talk about the cattle kingdom. The cattle that we see uh, during the 1860s uh, are coming up out of South Texas, and you have these cattle drives that stretch all the way up in, from South Texas all the way up to Kansas, taking the cattle to Kansas, the railheads, and then moving them east to uh, the markets uh, in places like New York, Chicago, and other areas. But the railroads are necessary to help do this. Because of the cattle, though, from South Texas bringing in diseases and ticks and fleas, uh, farmers and ranchers in other states began putting restrictions on Texas cattle. The cattle drives really only lasted about 20 years. By the 1880s, uh, the cattle drives are long gone. Part of that has to do with the expansion of railroads. A lot of international investors, we tend to think of uh, some guy on a ranch owning it, but there were corporations that got involved uh, and people from other countries were coming into Texas to buy up the land. Uh, one of those was the Matador Land and Cattle Company, for example. Its headquarters was in Scotland, and yet they own thousands of acres of West Texas land. And they are just one example. There were many international investors that bought land in Texas. And you had some very large ranches. Uh, the biggest ranch we see, and you see the map there of uh, the Gulf Coast, the King Ranch, about a million acres in about four counties in Texas, and various divisions, probably the most famous, headquartered at Kingsville, named after the King Ranch, was the Santa Gertrudes Division, and that became home of the first Texas breed of cattle, the Santa Gertrudes. The ranch was started in the 1860s following the Civil War by Richard King and Mifflin Kennedy. And they had been riverboat captains and they had done steam shipping up and down the Rio Grande during the Civil War. Even larger uh, was the XIT Ranch. And XIT stands for 10 in Texas. You can see the map on the right uh, hand side of the screen there and those show you the 10 counties that the XIT ranch made up, the Panhandle region. It made up over 3 million acres of land, much larger than the King Ranch by three times, 
and it was largely done for the company that built the state capital as payment. We'd look over at Native Americans in the West because as people were moving out, as ranchers were moving out, as later farmers were moving out to the West, they were encountering Native Americans who already lived in the West, who used the West. Following the Civil War, President Grant institutes what's known as the Quaker Peace Policy. The Quakers were a religious group, and they wanted to have peaceful relations with the Native Americans instead of a harsher policy. This resulted in the Treaty of Medicine Lodge Creek in 1867, which was a um, in, in held in Kansas, and it was a meeting of various Native American groups, tribal leaders, uh, and representatives. The problem was is that a lot of Native Americans didn't recognize the authority of those leaders to sign peace treaties for them. And so while there was on paper a peace treaty, in practice things weren't always uh, that so peaceful. You know that the Native Americans during the Civil War had pushed the frontier back about a hundred miles across the West. And so one of the things that uh, the federal government wanted to do was to reestablish uh, Native Americans back onto reservations, get them off that land and push that frontier forward again. Lori Tatum was the Indian agent at Fort Sill in Oklahoma, just along the Texas border. And that's where the Keough and the Comanche were in reservation. Uh, Tatum uh, was a Quaker. He tried to be very good to the Native Americans, but he was constantly thwarted because they were leaving the reservation largely because the reservations, uh, the food wasn't very good. Sometimes it was rotten meat. The companies that were contracted to provide food and supplies uh, weren't always doing a very good job. And so Native Americans were quite upset, uh, unhappy that they lost their native land, and unhappy to be on these reservations that, where they lived in squalor. In 1871, uh, the so-called Salt Creek Massacre, also known as the Warren Wagon Train Raid, occurred. This happened shortly after uh, William Tecumseh Sherman, a general for the U.S. Army, went to investigate the conditions of Native Americans on the Texas frontier. So he came in at Brownsville, and he and Buffalo soldiers who were guarding him uh, traveled up Texas to see the extent of Native American raids. He had heard that there were a lot of attacks going on, uh, and even after the tour, he didn't believe it. He arrived at Fort Richardson, which is just uh, around... Jacksboro, which is northwest of Fort Worth, and concluded that things weren't as bad. Well, a few hours later, about a hundred Native Americans who had watched Sherman attacked. They were led by Satank, Satanta, Big Tree, and they attacked this wagon train that was bringing supplies to the fort. Seven people were killed. This changed the Indian policy thereafter. And what they wanted to do was really push back and force Native Americans by any means necessary to stay on the reservation. And this was especially true uh, in Texas. They began refortifying all the frontier forts, and I've included a map here of where many of those forts were. Buffalo soldiers, these were the former African American troops uh, out of the four divisions uh, that served during the Civil War. And so you had the beginning of the so-called Indian Wars. This actually started in 1869. One example of problems that they had with Native Americans was the attack on the Adobe Walls trading outpost in 1874. Quanah Parker, a chief of one of the Band of Comanches, stationed at Fort Sill, left the reservation. About 700 attacked Adobe Walls. Uh, they were repelled and they retreated. It was the start of several Native American attacks. Attacks were coming from south of the border. And this was led by Juan Cortina. Um, Cortina had been a problem even before the Civil War. The so-called First Cortina War happened right before the Civil War. Cortina had witnessed uh, Mexican Americans being treated badly by law enforcement in Brownsville. So he attacked some law enforcement officers, and this started battles back and forth, attacks back and forth. The second Cortina War came about after the Civil War already started. Cortina joined the Union, volunteered to join the Union, and he and some of his men were attacking Confederates along the Rio Grande. Finally, uh, 
he settles down for a while. In the 1870s, however, he and some of his followers are implemented in some cattle rustling schemes, uh, and they call for his arrest. Now, here's the thing about Cortina. We don't know how big his gang really was, or if it was just a fear that people were associated with him, or willing to blame any Mexican or Mexican-American who was causing problems with being associated with Cortina. So some of it may be exaggerated, some of it really may have been him. We do know that he was very active at this time. The Farmer's Frontier, this is the name we give to the expanse of farmers uh, as they began moving west. The state population between 1860 and 1890 increased tremendously from a little over half a million to well over two million people in a 30-year period. That is a lot of people moving into the state. Most of them do live in the rural areas. And this was facilitated in large part due to the growth of railroads across Texas. Now this is a map I've shown you near Amarillo. Uh, how the land was divided up into sections. You can see that northern line that kind of stretches across the map. That's a railroad. And you can see how the sections are determined off. And it's in that checkerboard square. Some sections of land are sold, some are not. Those are probably land where the railroad is getting money from the government. And you had two major roads going across Texas early on, the Texas and Pacific, which was, of course, moving westward. And then you also have the Fort Worth and Denver, which is moving kind of northwestern. Another invention that facilitated the farmers was the development of barbed wire. This, of course, kept cattle from moving onto your land. You put up the wire, the cattle don't cross it because of the barbs in the wire. This led to a so-called fence war as people were trying to move their cattle during the cattle drives. And this is what kind of put an end to the cattle drives. Uh, they were running into farmers who had put fencing up to keep cattle out. Well, they were also fencing off water. And in Texas, you cannot uh, stop people from having access to water. And so people were cutting the fences. If they caught you cutting the fences, though, they might hang you. You looked at some of the sources uh, that I provided, some of the primary sources about this fence war that was going on. And this is what was causing that. This is what was leading to those fencing wars. The farmers were having many problems, though, as they moved west. And, of course, it wasn't just them. There were problems across the west. In 1890, the Federal Census Bureau declared that the frontier was over, meaning that settlement had so expanded across the middle part of the American West that there was no longer a frontier. You also had the rise of industrialism. It, farmers weren't just farming by hand, but they were uh, using better and better implements, some mechanized. And so you had changes to the farming community, changes to the way people farmed, and uh, that affected the frontier. Also, again, with an excess of cotton, because you had more people moving west, more people establishing farms, more people trying to plant cotton, as you have a surplus of cotton, the price of cotton declines. So this is going to make it harder for farmers who are out there working, planting their crops, to make a living. What they could make a living with before wasn't cutting it anymore. And so this is going to lead to farmers' unrest. The farmers began forming unions, or at least associations. One of those popular ones was the Grange. This is followed, formed by a former military officer who wanted to get farmers together. Um, he, many of them lived in isolation, and he felt that they should have community projects and community events. And so he started the Grange. The official name was the National Grange of the Patrons of Husbandry. We call it the Grange for short. This civic club, these civic organizations, gave rise to political organizations as farmers became more and more upset. And in, in central Texas, around Lampasas and Hillsboro, you had the beginning of the so-called Farmers Alliance. Eventually in Texas, it'll become known as the Southern Farmers Alliance. And this will give rise to a movement called populism, or the People's Party. And in Texas, the effect of populism... Uh, they even had their own newspaper. You can see the Southern Mercury. James Hogg, who later becomes governor of the state, 
uh, is very interested in reform that's going to help the farmers. One of the things that the farmers were upset about were railroads. Railroads had advertised land, they had brought people out, they had set people up, but then uh, farmers were upset because they weren't making as much money as they used to at the price railroads were charging to send crops to market. And so they formed the Texas Railroad Commission in order to regulate prices that railroads are charging. One of the other things that uh, came about was prohibition. And prohibition had been around for a while, starting off in about the 1840s. But by the 1870s and 80s, you have the formation of various organizations that are going to have effect on Texas. First is the United Friends of Temperance. Now, temperance wasn't against drinking altogether, but they wanted it moderated. But you do have the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and many of them were prohibitionists. Not only do they want you to cut back on liquor, but that wasn't enough. They wanted you to stop it altogether. And you see how these programs uh, expand, and that women were also involved in this. Uh, and it was kind of in the woman's sphere that it was okay for women to get involved because it was a moral issue. In 1876, when the new Constitution was founded, based upon agrarian interests, you see the uh, implementation of what they call local option laws. Counties could decide if they were going to be wet, allowing liquor and alcohol, or dry, not allowing it. By 1895, you had 15, 53 counties that were completely dry and another 79 that were at least partially dry. So that's where this lecture will end and we'll pick up talking about the political successes of progressives and how they turn into populists in the next lecture.